CTSVI with MR venography and flow quantification and the role of MRI in treatment planning. So yes, right up front I would like to say that I think that for a number of reasons patients should have MR scans before they see an interventionalist. And there are many reasons for this. The first one is the neurologists want them to have an MR scan because you need to see if you have the, the lesions, the normal lesions. You want to know where those lesions are. And if any treatment regimen is going to work, you want to know if those lesions are in fact stabilizing or going away over time. So from a practical point of view, I would think if I were the patient's neurologist, I would definitely want the MR scan. Because later on, they're going to get scanned again a year later or two years later or three years later to, to make sure that in fact they're, they're doing fine. Um, the other reasons are that MR can give us wonderful three-dimensional information. So this, I hope, will be useful to the interventionalists. Uh, it may help them understand some more complicated geometries that we see sometimes uh, associated with this. All right, so I assume I have to point this in a particular direction. Let's just try this instead. No. There we go. And, and of course, work like this really it involves a collaboration with many people, and I, I list some of them here who have uh, contributed material or sent me slides or, or, or just sent me uh, information that I can use. And at the bottom, including two of my students who worked very hard on, on some of the calculations that I'll show you. Now, for having trouble with this, let's try that instead. There we go. Um, so I'm going to talk to you uh, today a little bit about some of the imaging components for multiple sclerosis and CCSVI, just a small bit about the role of iron uh, in MS, and then I'm going to show a few slides on perfusion imaging of the brain that talks about um, a technology that allows us to look whether or not there is hypoperfusion and what role that hypoperfusion might play and how it might even demonstrate the vascular link associated with MS. And then a little bit on future directions and the concept of uh, an international database. So in conventional MR, we get these wonderful three-dimensional images, or in this case, a series of two-dimensional slices through the brain that let us take a look at uh, where the lesions are and what the abnormalities are. In this case, you've seen some of these before, but it's just to give you an idea that, you know, these lesions tend to be around the ventricles, corpus callosum, sometimes uh, a little outside that region, and sometimes they even get into the gray matter. And I think, as was said before, there may be seven types of multiple sclerosis lesions. Um, the, the venous system is, of course, quite a complicated system. And it, it's rather interesting that in some of the other work we've done, we've shown that there's roughly 70% venous blood volume, about 20 to 25% arterial blood volume, and maybe 5% capillary blood volume in the brain. So as you can see, you have you know, three to four times the amount of venous blood volume, which makes sense because if you have very, uh, say a centimeter um, common carotid bringing blood in at the rate of between 20 and 100 centimeters per second, and the blood is only coming out at on the order of 5 to 20 centimeters per second in the veins, you're going to need roughly four times as many veins to carry that blood out at the same rate that you brought it in. So that's one of the reasons why you have more veins than arteries. Um, this is a, another example in this case of something we call a T1-weighted MRI scan done pre and post contrast. Often the neurologists will look at this because they want to see if there are any new lesions or acute lesions that have developed since the previous time. And, and if there is any leakage of the contrast agent, that's usually a marker of acute lesions. So again, that's a, a, one of the advantages that when I show you the MR venograms that we're going to look at shortly, um, this is something that comes out of this, that at the end of the venograms, we can recollect this data and also get this information that the neurologist would have wanted anyways. So Zamboni's criteria to, to look at the vascular system are that, uh, is there any evidence, or especially high resolution evidence for stenosis? Is the reflux present in the internal jugular veins or no flow? Is the reflux in the deep cerebral veins 
Or is there a decrease in the jugular vein cross-section when you change from sitting up to supine? Because generally speaking, we know from the comments you heard earlier that the vertebral system does the most job while I'm standing up here. And if I lie down, the jugulars open up, or at least they should open up, and they provide more of the flow when you're lying down. And in MS patients, it may be that the jugulars can't respond normally, so they don't respond to that change, and, and therefore there are problems that result from it. Not that we really understand the physiology of those problems yet, but we certainly are looking at the macroscopic effects of this. So uh, here's an example for you on the left-hand side, you see uh, the normal venous system for a volunteer. You have nice patent internal jugular veins. And on the right-hand side, you see a, a rather interesting truncular venous malformation. The left internal jugular vein comes down and just stops. Now, there may be, as Sal has pointed out to me, a tiny little stream that, that comes from there and might connect to the subclavian. I don't happen to see it here because the resolution that I'm showing you is roughly one cubic millimeter. So I, I, I won't say I can image down to 200 microns with this technique at this point. But one of the things that might be interesting to do in the future is once we think we've found such a stenosis cell, I can actually go back and collect the data with 200 micron resolution locally. So in fact, we could go in and take yet a few more minutes, David, um, to reevaluate local, what we think are local stenosis with very high resolution. So MR really offers you this wonderful opportunity. And of course, I don't have to try to find where that catheter is going. I don't have to see, well, am I into the vertebral or am I missing it? And did I really find the internal jugular? Uh, with MR, you can do all of this in three dimensions in, in a reasonable period of time. Now, the other thing that we do is when we, a contrast agent is injected, we collect the data over a certain period of time. So we, we, some of the, the data can be collected in seven seconds. At some sites, it's 15 seconds. But if you're lucky, you're going to hit the arterial phase first. And the arterial phase, which is the image on the left side, is, is very nice because you've captured pretty much all the incoming contrast agent without any confusion with the, the veins yet. In the middle image, you start to see this confusion with the veins. You also see these upper level uh, narrowings in this case. And these are the ones that, that Sal is suggesting actually may come from a problem that is occurring at, at the confluence of the jugulars with the subclavian and brachiocephalic. Clearly, if you're an interventional person doing this work, you want to start at the valves first and see, is there a problem? And then you may find, after you've treated those valves, that what we were seeing in MR is, is gone. And in fact, if I re-image somebody and, and look at this again, I may find they're gone too. So Sal, I, although I wouldn't want to necessarily operate in that area, I would say that it's a good marker that there's something abnormal there. And so this is, I think, useful information um, for the interventionalist. Now you can see the image gets very complicated later on after about a minute and 15 seconds, but here you can begin to see the vertebral plexus very clearly. There's more contrast agent that's made its way into the very slowly moving vessels, and so there's lots of information available to us here, both in time and in space. Sal showed that one already, so I'll move on. Um, and we'll just wait a few seconds. If this doesn't come on, it means it wasn't able to read the movie. That's too bad. So the nice thing is that we can create these 3D uh, movies as well for you to look at. So you can see the entire vasculature, whether it's venous by itself, arterial by itself, or all of it together, that would really let you look at this in three dimensions and, and understand that whole vascular behavior. So this is another example, but in, in this case, uh, this isn't just simply a pinching of the vessels that was shown previously. Uh, this is a, a narrowing here. And, and what we can do, and I'll show you some examples of this later, is we can cut through this coronal picture like this. And I can look directly at the cross-section of those vessels. If the vessels are collapsed, I will see it as a long, thin strip of a collapsed vein. But if the vessel is truly narrowed or stenotic, I will see it as a very tiny cross-section or constriction of that of that vessel. So again, MR does offer you that possibility. But we see quite a variety of things. This is a, a long shoestring-like narrowing of the right internal jugular in this case. 
Um, I'm going to show you a few examples to, to demonstrate some of the things that you might see um, when you go in to do the treatment. Um, this is a, a more complicated case. Here you can see uh, multiple stenosis, and it's very complicated up by the sigmoid sinus. Uh, sometimes we actually see the, the projection of the or beginning of the jugular just veer off to one side and completely stop. And, and the, what would have been the jugular is now fed by part of the vertebral system or alternate veins that actually then will drain out the, the conventional jugular. So again, this three-dimensional information tells you a lot of what's happening at the upper level that might be otherwise difficult for you to see from um, a PTA approach. Uh, this example here, I think, again, is another case, but shows that you can see these upper level or distal stenosis. Um, that could be coming from a problem further down. Sometimes we also see this loss of signal here, which is usually associated with a collapse vein. So that may be a valvular problem. In this individual here on the right, you can see more of a narrowing, in fact, multiple narrowings here. That may or may not be associated with a valvular problem. So even in the, just these first few slides that I'm showing you, we see quite a range of different types of manifestations of these um, valvular effects, these truncular venous malformations. I think this example here shows a little bit better the case that I was talking about, where you get this stump appearing in the upper right jugular, and then you have other veins that are draining into what was the conventional jugular vein, but nevertheless, there are still two more stenosis in that internal jugular. So if you were to go up there with a the catheter, you'd find your way to the top, but you would not be finding your way into the sigmoid sinus. So here you can actually tell from this the type of problems that are taking place. Um, here's a, a, the opposite example of what I showed you at the beginning. Again, a truncular venous malformation. You can see this just stops here. Um, it's possible there might be a thin string that might make its way up to the sigmoid, and with a catheter you might find that. But one of the things that, that I would suggest, and, and I think Gary Siskin told me that, that he does it this way, that you, you and Gary should correct me if I'm incorrect, um, that you in inject initially first before you put the catheter all the way up. Because as Sal was showing, if you have a membrane that's blocking the flow and you push the catheter through, you're going to open that membrane. If you have a, a narrowing there and you push the catheter up through it, it may not be quite as narrow as it was, at least in the images that I have. Or you may find that there is just no, no major vessel that continues to the sigmoid here. Now, the case on the right-hand side is particularly interesting because normally, and I talked with Paolo about this, normally you will not see, uh, you will see at least a thin thread going down to the jugular stump. And in this particular case, this uh, narrows significantly and then veers off and joins in with the external jugular. So it does not connect with the truncular, with the, 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 the stump or the truncular venous malformation. So again, what would you have done if you were going in there with the catheter? So having this three-dimensional information is really valuable. Plus it, it, of course, will demonstrate to you things like the enhancement of the vertebral plexus. So in these two particular cases, these people are lucky. They have very good response in their vertebral system and they can really carry the blood away well. There are MS patients I've seen where the vertebral system is not well developed at all. And so those people who have possible um, truncular venous malformations, who have bad flow, and their venous system cannot carry the blood away, they're likely to be ones that are going to suffer a little worse. So my guess is we're going to find we have probably on the order of 20 different manifestations of CCSVI. So if you want to run a really good clinical trial here, double-blinded or not, you're probably going to have to do about 25 cases per characterization of this disease. So in that case, you know, 20 times 25, that's at least 500 you're going to have to do. And, and you know, this is kind of jumping ahead of it for the people who have been talking about, well, we'll do, you know, 50 normals and, and 50 of something else. That's just not going to be good enough. We really need to be merging our data together so that we can create a classification scheme for this now. We don't want to wait five years to produce this classification scheme. Um, here again, you have a similar example I showed at the beginning. You have a different example here on the right-hand side. In this particular case, it's not a collapsing. It's a narrowing 
as you approach the, the valve. And so you may find bad valves and truncular effects and narrowing taking place all at the same time. So extremely variable. I'm going to skip this for now. And I want to show you that when we get this 3D data, we collect the data coronally from the back of the head all the way to the front of the face. And so we can go in and pull out different regions of thickness here and focus in on different parts of the vascular system. So you can see on the left-hand side, we can separate out the deep cervical veins. And in, luckily, in many MS cases, these deep cervical veins become very large and they carry away a lot of the blood. Sometimes the vertebral veins will do that. Other times you will see clear connections between um, the left and right aspects of the vertebral system. I see this more in MS patients than I do in normals. So all of this information is accessible to me as a means to study the patient before I do the treatment. I don't do the treatment. I meant you as a group of people doing the treatment. So I'm going to skip this a little bit. As you can see, there are, are, are many different um, examples that, that I can go through here. This was a particularly interesting case because here again, depending on how you look at this, if you use very thick slices on the left-hand side, it's kind of hard to see through that vertebral plexus. But as you narrow down and focus in on just a few slices of interest, you can now see more clearly that there's a problem associated with the left internal jugular vein in the upper region. And, and perhaps, Sal, down at the bottom here, maybe even that confluence is abnormal. I, I can't tell in this case. And this is where we really need comparisons with the, the angioplasty. This is a normal person. Can a normal person have narrowing up in that part? Sure. I mean, that's a pretty uh, a difficult area for the um, vessels to traverse. And if you look at this, you can say, yes, that looks narrowed. But you can see the rest of the veins look just fine in that case. Excuse me, I'm going to skip a little bit of this also. Uh, I want to show you this image because it, it shows you that when I think I see a narrowing, I don't just stop and say, okay, that's interesting, it's a narrowing. We take many hours to process this data. We look at it carefully in all orientations. And in this case, we cut through a given region of interest. So, for example, in region four, if you look at the orange arrow, you can see a nice cross-section for that vessel. If you look at slice three, where I think I don't see anything on the 3D, I don't see anything in this case on, on the transverse orientation either. So the nice thing about the transverse orientation is I can follow that vessel all the way from the sigmoid sinus all the way down through carefully one slice at a time. Remember, each of these slices is only one millimeter thick. So it's possible I'm missing a half, a half millimeter vessel and there could be thin connections there. But usually if I can't see anything, there, there's probably nothing there because this technique using a contrast agent is able to see things that conventional MR cannot see because the flow is so slow I couldn't pick it up. In this case, since we're imaging over many minutes, we, we watch this contrast agent change as a function of time. Even those areas with very slow flow will eventually enhance and I can find them. So if I can't find them with the contrast agent, it means it must be either not there or very slow flow. Um, this was a, a particularly puzzling case because um, the ultrasound showed there was a stenosis here. The ultrasound showed there was reflux here. And I think the, the young lady who, who um, was involved in that is actually here in the audience. Um, and then we, we had done an MR here and we found what looked like a narrowing. Uh, there may be a thin connection with the upper region. You notice that the, the top yellow arrow shows a bright portion of the jugular vein. And that's because the contrast agent is sitting there, I just couldn't get out. But it's reached equilibrium in every other part of the vascular system. Also with MR, we showed there was reflux here. And yet, when they went in with the catheter, the catheter went up to the top and injected, they found nothing. So the, the conclusion was that, that there wasn't a problem there. And my, my personal feeling is there's a problem there. So the question is, how you do this procedure may be important. I believe they also used a breath hold when they did this. So they had the person hold the breath and injected. Um, and in that case, that may change the dynamics of the jugular as well. So my guess is if I were to rescan this person, I'll probably find the same thing the next time I rescan him, unless putting that catheter up there actually affected the blood flow itself. 
Now, we can image the azygous. Not very well, though. I mean, I'm going to show you one or two examples. Sometimes we're lucky, and we get good images, like I'm showing you here. Um, you can even see evidence on the right-hand side, which is not a particularly good picture, but probably good enough to say I would be concerned about that azygous. And every once in a while, we can even see the hemiazygous as well, so it's a little bit like out of the textbook. Um, it's not very good here because when we collect this data, the person's breathing, and so these little um, black stripes you see is because the, the person is in a different position each time we have collected that 2D slice. The individual slice itself looks very good, but when I try to present it to you in this cross-sectional view, you can see the artifacts associated with it. Nevertheless, I hope we can continue to improve the ability to do the ASGIS. Now I want to point out to you that, that um, I, I think ultrasound is important. I think ultrasound will help you look at the valves and the, and the valvular function, but I don't think ultrasound is as good as MR in giving you 3D information. I don't think it's even as good as MR in giving you flow quantification. So I want to show you an example of how we do flow quantification in MR. And here we do a cross-sectional image with a resolution of roughly half a millimeter by half a millimeter in plane. So that's pretty high resolution. I can get the cross-section of the vessels extremely well, as you can see on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we measure what we call the phase. And the phase we have made sensitive to the flow. So when you see black here for the um, right internal jugular vein, that means that the flow is going towards the heart. And the white means it's arterial and the flow is going towards the brain. And so we can see these vessels very well. In fact, we're at the point now that maybe in a few months we will have the, the, the capability to give you the entire cardiovascular input and output to the brain as measured through one slice like this. Now, on the right-hand side here, I'm showing you a plot of what the normal peak velocities would be through some of these veins that we're looking at. And it ranges from 5, 10, 15, on some people, maybe even 20 centimeters per second. And we can very clearly see that, but we can also integrate that information across the cross-section of the vessel and give you average speeds. We can give you um, total flow per heartbeat, for example. So what I, sh what I need to tell you is each of the little dots in these plots here represents about 50 milliseconds in the cardiac cycle. So we collect the data roughly 20 times per second so that we can map out the flow from diastole to systole and th again throughout the cardiac cycle. So what does it look like when we have somebody with multiple sclerosis? Well, here's an example, uh, again, where you can see that the, the green here on the left-hand side, the green circle represents the uh, right internal jugular vein, and you can see that you have a complete, not just reduction of flow, you have a reversal of flow, that that flow is now flowing back towards the brain. It's at roughly half the cardiac cycle, which is close to one of Zamboni's conditions, and it's not just in one vessel in this case, it's in all four of the major veins for this particular individual. So the MR can very nicely demonstrate what's happening to the functional aspects of the vessels, not just the anatomical aspects. And we create from this a nice table that then gives me total cardiovascular input output. And, and so these are the, some of the numbers you can get. But maybe the functional part can do even a little bit more than that. Since I can't see the valves with MR, sometimes I get a normal looking case. And if you were just using the MR, you would say, OK, I can't see anything wrong here. But in fact, if I do the flow quantification for this individual, I can see that there is, in fact, reflux associated with this that you can see right here, in fact, in both of the internal jugular veins. So I don't necessarily need the anatomy information. I need both anatomy and function together to give you the complete picture. And Sal has already talked to you about that. So I'm going to move on a little bit now and talk just a, a bit about looking at the very small veins in the brain. And although I don't have these results here, I will tell you about Robert Zavadinov's work. This is really a wonderful example where in, in five to ten minutes, we can get a picture of all these small vessels in your brain, some of these as small as two to three hundred microns. And on the right-hand side, you have an example of a, a, a cadaver brain where a dye was injected and a radiographic image was taken. And my students are very happy that I, I don't sacrifice them to prove this. So luckily, um, luckily, George Salomon did all this work for us over about a 30 or 40 year time period. And uh, he sent, kindly sent me this picture because you can see the match is almost perfect. So it, it, it's no surprise if I tell you I think I'm looking at veins with this technology, and indeed they, they are veins. 
And um, this is an interesting example to show you that when I see these very dark structures, why do I see them? I see them because they have deoxyhemoglobin in them. And, and so the deoxyhemoglobin acts like a, a paramagnetic substance and it causes a reduction of the signal in the brain. And on the right-hand side is a volunteer who basically had two cups of coffee. He took a no-dose pill, 200 milligrams of caffeine. And you can see these vessels even better. In fact, you can see even smaller vessels right by the arrow here that weren't visible before. Now, why is that? That's because caffeine is a vasoconstrictive agent and it slows the blood flow to the brain. So we actually see more of these small veins. So you're actually looking at the reactivity of the brain, so to speak, under some type of stress. In this case, it's a caffeine stress. So what Robert did is he used this technology uh, to look at what's happening in MS patients. And he found that, in fact, he couldn't see as many veins on more severe MS cases. Now, that's a little strange because if you have reduced blood flow, why, why wouldn't I be seeing this caffeine effect? Well, if you have reduced blood flow and reduced blood volume or reduced blood flow and brain tissue that's actually not functioning and not taking up the oxygen as it's supposed to take it up, in fact, the vessels, as you see them here, will begin to disappear. Now, this is actually in fairly good agreement with work by Yu Lin Gu from New York University who spent the last five years demonstrating that there appears to be reduced perfusion to the brain in MS patients. And maybe some of the effects we're looking at that David was suggesting something else was going on could in fact be caused by hypoxia. If you're not getting enough oxygen to the tissue, then the, the, there are going to be immunological effects associated with this. So what, what role does hypoxia play? And eventually I can tell you that in some of the lesions when we do perfusion imaging, we don't see any blood flow there at all on some chronic lesions. That means that that tissue is probably ischemic. There's, there's no functioning there at all. If I were to do MR spectroscopy and try to measure NAA, I might not see any present at all. So the, the, the longer these lesions are there, probably the worse off the tissue is at that point. So we, we saw one of those before. Um, I, I want to just point out to go with this picture that Fabrizio showed, we did a plot of 100 normals to plot how much iron they have in different parts of the brain. And all these little pink dots and blue dots, they represent normal people. And you can see that the amount of iron increases as you get older. Well, I do like to quote Burton Dreher on this. He, he says that we all rust when we get older, so we have to kind of map how much rusting has taken place. And all of these triangles and the X's that are in this plot, they're MS patients. So you can see none of my hundred normals lie up at this high level of iron that we see in MS. Now this may be a little hard to see, I'm sorry, but, but it's quite an impressive result that it literally is hot off the press. I got it yesterday morning from the students. We, we did 53 MS cases and looked at 106 measurements. So we did left side, right side, and we looked at seven areas in the brain, the basal ganglia and the thalamus and pulvinar thalamus. And all the red X's represent the, the increased iron content in MS patients. And all the blue dots, and as you can see, there's perhaps 10 of them, represent 10 out of 272 measurements on normals. Those are the only 10 that show on this plot. So you can see that it, it's quite impressive that there definitely is abnormal iron present in a large number of the MS cases. Not all of them, because there's only about 30 here out of 106. So roughly 30% are present. Now, the, the early work by Adams shows that there is, in fact, hemosiderin in about 30% of MS lesions. Not all MS lesions show, show evidence of perhaps a microbleeding or hemosiderin, but some do. So here I want to show you an image of the thalamostriate area. This is the normal veins in, in this part of the brain. You don't see any dark effects like I showed you in the previous image. And, I, and then Fabrizio showed this picture. And here is an image now of an MS patient. And in each of these areas, we're looking at iron increases in the area of the draining veins of each of these structures. So could it be that the iron is related to a breakdown of the venous endothelial system? Yes, it's possible. Does iron leak out and cause um, 
problems? Well, we know iron is very toxic. We've known this for 100 years, and I'm still not sure that anybody neurologically has demonstrated that, that iron in any of the diseases, whether it's Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or, or MS, has really led to a degeneration of the, the brain tissue, but it's possible. Um, it's also possible that iron is just a biomarker of the degradation that's taking place locally. Maybe it, it doesn't have a direct physiological effect. So we don't know the answer to this yet, but we do know that the more iron that is present, that we tend to have more serious effects. So let me skip ahead here. And now I, I want to go on to um, show you just two slides of some perfusion work. We usually use perfusion weighted imaging to measure local cerebral blood volume, cerebral blood flow, mean transit time in the tissue. We do this a lot for stroke imaging, for example. And we can show very nice the vascular territory that's been affected. But this technique I'm going to tell you just a little bit about without any equations is we call it the tissue similarity map. And basically what we do is this, is we follow the time course of how the contrast agent gets taken up over a period of about one minute. And we watch this change in signal and we take from one region of interest that signal change and we ask how does this correlate with the vascular response everywhere else in the brain. It's very much like functional connectivity. So what we did in this particular case is we took one of the lesions in the flare data, we highlighted a small area in one lesion, and then we ran it through this process. And you can see here in the middle image, all of the areas that are dark blue, dark blue means that it behaves the same as the previous tissue. So that's easy to understand in this case, dark blue means zero. So if the signal is the same at two pixels and I subtract it, I'm going to get zero. So I don't, it's not that simple, but it's that idea. So you can see here that if I draw the following area here, I pick up all these other lesions. That suggests to me that the vascular connectivity of these lesions are all related, maybe because they're related to the same venous drainage system. But it's pretty amazing. We've done this in 10 cases now. And if I draw the lesion here, I pick up this entire area by the ventricles, showing that they have exactly the same vascular functionality associated with them. And then this is just two more examples. And perhaps the upper case is the more interesting one. Not only can we pick up all the lesions here from this technique, but you can see that there's a, a connectivity. I'm going to show you the right-hand image now. The right-hand image is a a reversal of the central image showing the lesions as bright or red. You see the green area that's connecting these lesions. It doesn't show in flare at all, but it has a very similar vascular behavior to the area of the lesions. And so my guess is that this may be representing the vascular territory that is most affected by this disease. So this is an area still of study, but also demonstrates the role of the vascular problems that we may be dealing with in multiple sclerosis. Well, even though I'm not focusing on, on uh, Tracy Putnam's work, I, it's hard not to show this quote. It was a wonderful quote from, uh, from Gray's Anatomy that, that Sal showed. But, so what, what Tracy Putnam did in 1935 is he did 14 dogs, and he occluded the small veins in the dog brain. And over the period of a year, all these dogs developed sclerotic lesions. So he says, the similarity between such lesions and many of those seen in cases of multiple sclerosis in man is so striking that the conclusion appears almost inevitable that venular obstruction is the essential immediate antecedent to the formation of typical sclerotic plaques. Well, I wish that he'd had an MR scanner or, or an ultrasound scanner or something like that in his day, because I'm sure that Tracy would have discovered what Paolo discovered very recently. So there is a lot in the literature that I can't talk to you about today, but there's 75 years of evidence of vascular involvement in multiple sclerosis. So future directions, I think it's going to be very important for us to, to do ultrasound and MR imaging pretreatment, to continue to characterize the type of venous problems that are there, uh, to ensure that the patients are, are able to get imaged again for perhaps a year after surgery, and can compare their data from before surgery. Um, from a science point of view, it's going to be very interesting to study the fluid dynamics of the venous system 
and understand the cardiovascular input-output and how that might be changed because of this chronic cerebral spinal venous insufficiency. And then I think it's important for us to create an international imaging protocol and an international database for us to, to use. And so along these lines, um, one of the things we'd like to see happen, and I think Sal has suggested it and, men, and many other people are, are coming to this conclusion, that it would be very nice for us to have uh, some type of imaging database where people can send their data. We're going to need IRBs for this, but I think to characterize what's happening in MS is going to take thousands of cases for us to really understand it. And I think, on, on, you know, for the patients, things are happening very fast. Things are picking up speed. I think it's quite viable that if the sites around the world combined their data, within a year we could easily have one to 2,000 cases in this database and maybe more. So with that, I, I would like to stop and thank you very much.